Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with revenge, after being wronged. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. The first story. Faced with a gambler's emails sent to the wrong address, an attempt to help ends up triggering an unintended divorce outcome. The second story. Lawyer's quiet exit transforms into an upheaval in a company's sale leaving management red-faced and lawyers unrelenting. The third story. Two frustrated bartenders at a fancy event take justice into their own hands, over-pouring drinks after receiving no tips. The first story is... You're mad at me over your gambling problem? Background. About 25 years ago, I registered my last name.com for my personal use. I mostly use it as an email server for my family. Unfortunately, there are many businesses around the world that use my last name dot their country code for their websites and email. As such, I regularly get business emails sent to my server. Most of the time this just bounces, but sometimes they happen to match the name of a user or former user of my mail server. As all the companies have been polite so far, I routinely forward business-related email to the correct addresses. Because it doesn't really cost me anything, I've set up personal email addresses for some people I don't actually know who happen to have my last name, as long as they agree to not use it for spam. 20 years ago, there was this one grand who happened to have the same first name as my deceased uncle. I was monitoring that address, just in case anything important legally or financially came through, to make sure that his family didn't get surprised by anything. The guy who decided to use that for his address had a serious gambling problem. I was getting emails from several gambling sites, often multiple times per day, with transaction records for large, at least from my perspective, deposits. These were all credit card transactions, very often for offshore online casinos, so they didn't exactly abide by banking regulations, either in the USA or his home country. In other words, I often got the full credit card numbers and expiration dates emailed unencrypted. Because some of these transactions also had his physical address, I did have a way to contact him. First, by using that, I was able to figure out what his actual personal email address was. I did not want to use his company email because of the nature of what I was sending. So I emailed him and explained the problem, and asked him if he was really comfortable with me having access to several of his credit cards. He accused me of being a hacker, called me several names that I shouldn't repeat here, and blew me off because I kept getting the email receipts. At this point, I figured out that he was probably digging himself and his family into a fairly deep financial hole. And while I was annoyed with him for ignoring his problem and being rude, I didn't think that his family should pay the price for his bad gambling habit. Because I had his home address, I was able to figure out his wife's name and where she worked. I printed up a stack of about 20 of the emails, put them into an envelope marked personal and confidential, and dropped them into the mail in her office. A Couple of weeks later, the gambling emails stopped. A few months after that, out of curiosity, I did a search for them again, and found the legal notice for their divorce. Oops. The second story is, don't antagonize your lawyer while you're selling your company. I was an in-house lawyer in a multinational company that sold software. I specifically joined this relatively lesser known company to learn more about compliance. The company was listed on the stock exchange, meaning more compliance work. I highlighted this specifically as one of the reasons for my seeking out a change. I discovered it was filled with senior citizens, not an age thing when I joined. Basically, a company full of old-timers who were there purely because they're close to the company's owners. As part of the onboarding experience, I had to sit through sermons of how they changed the industry and how they know XX. This meant I had three different bosses. One senior guy who was the fixer. I'll call him Senior Guy 1 for convenience. No one really knew what he did, but he got a cabin to himself. Another was an ex-senior management guy who got a gig from the owner to negotiate tech contracts. Senior Guy 2. I highlight this because this ex-senior management guy asked me, what's an EULA? Another was my reporting manager with whom I was expected to work on a day-to-day -day basis, Senior Guy 3. One month after joining, I was told that the company was going private through a sale to another entity. I was shocked, but I had loans to pay, so I continued. For some reason, I was senior enough for them to handle this independently. This meant I worked through nights to complete tasks that a law firm would ordinarily do. I also worked on the definitive agreement that was in use for the company to be sold. This will become important later. By the third month, I had decided the role wasn't what was advertised, and I was essentially cheap labor for M&A. Buyers were from another city and had planned to have their office there. I was not keen on moving. 
I read between the lines and started lining up interviews. Things went south quickly. Old timers were unhappy that I was looking for a job because that would mean they're answerable to owners or worse, have to do the work themselves. Cue the harassment which really solidified my resolve to leave. All my complaints about Senior Guy 1 and 2 to Senior Guy 3 were met with typical management talk. He sympathized and badmouthed them for burdening the company that he tolerates only because they're closer to the owner. Senior Guy 2 started countering all my remarks and comments on drafting on email. Even minor agreement points required discussion. If it was his mistake, then we had a call. However, if Senior Guy 2 raised the point, it suddenly made commercial sense. This wasn't my first rodeo. I really didn't care about proving a point because I wanted out as soon as possible. Any pushback, fights are going to be on deaf ears because from where I am, labor laws are at best recommendations unless you're unionized. The only option is to leave. I was peeved and tired of being pushed over, but I wondered if it was just me angry at the whole situation and finding faults. I had an opportunity to test my theory. So in one of the contracts that we were drafting, I made comments and sent them to Senior Guy too. As expected, he countered with verbal suggestions on the phone, which didn't make sense, obviously. However, because he's senior, I had to do the song and dance to explain the points. So I arranged for the call, explained to him and documented this on email attributing each verbal recommendation, time of the call, and the decisions suggested by him. Then I sent this back to him for approval. However, this time I CC'd my boss, Senior Guy 3, and asked for his approval on recommendations. Surprisingly, this practice was entirely new to them. Both of them were peeved at me. Senior Guy 2 and 3 were not happy. Senior Guy 2 was being questioned for the first time on email, and Senior Guy 3 couldn't ignore my email as the head of my department. Unsurprisingly, I got a single line non-answer from Senior Guy 3, basically asking me to discuss this with Senior Guy 2, followed by a verbally heated instruction to just do what Senior Guy 2 wants and not bother him. Now I was sure that this wasn't going to work for me in the short term or the long term. So I resigned and gave my notice period of one month, since I was on probation. Senior Guy 3 was peeved because he thought the notice period was for three months and the sale of the company was expected to close in one to two months. Cue the one month harassment that typically follows in any toxic work environment after you resign. On the last working day, I walked up to Senior Guy 3's cabin and did the obligatory thank you communication. He basically told me that I'm picking a huge fight and he will see that I never get employed in the industry again. He also told me that he's not going to pay me my full and final settlement of dues in a relieving letter. A huge deal in India to get to your next job. Employers hold off on these as blackmail for troublesome employees. His tone implied that there's very little I could do because they were all senior guys and they've been there done that. I wasn't the first disgruntled employee for him. I said my goodbyes. I got IT to confirm that I've returned the company's assets and CC'd my personal email. However, I was peeved as well at the whole ordeal and had made up my mind not to show this on my CV. I call it my one-two shot. Shot one. Once I left, I spoke with my friend and decided to serve a legal notice, detailing the ordeal and treatment meted out to me. Ordinarily, the legal notice barely makes a difference as the management is usually thick-skinned about it. However, the legal notice was also sent to the owners, not just the company. This wasn't really required, but I did it anyways. Turns out many directors were peeved at Senior Guy 1, 2, and 3, but were quiet just waiting to sell this company out. My act of involving the owners meant the entire board, including outside directors, mandatory for listed entities. This turned into a festival of explanations by all three in front of the owners. From what I hear, they all had to personally take leave to meet the owners, as shareholders, and explain themselves as naughty kids. Needless to say, everyone in the company was talking about it. I waited for one month to see if the notice had any effect from them being chided like kids. Expectedly, I got no response, but I knew from Grapevine that they now had to spend on a law firm to reply to me because shareholders were aware of this information. I had made my point, but now I wanted more. I really didn't want to drag it because I was also looking for jobs and had loans to pay. However, their template management response, this time with HR copied, basically implied that since I had left without notice, they were evaluating all options, including considering me AWOL. Senior Guy 2 basically threatened me that he will not pay me my dues on my relieving letter evidencing service, and implied that there's very little I can do about it. Petty that I am, I made plans to get both. Shot 2. Since I had access to the definitive agreement and remembered huge details about it, having worked with law firms throughout the agreement in detail, I was aware of who stays and goes. I made sure to speak to those who were going to let go. Cue mass resignations and missed deadlines. I knew the specific approvals that would trigger because of the transaction. So I spoke to the authorities who would approve this transaction as a disgruntled employee. 
The authority made their own inquiries. The owners got spooked. It was definitely not serious enough to scare them into thinking that the deal won't get approved. But the mere fact that a government authority was calling them meant they now had to deal with the authority, which would have never have happened if it wasn't for me. Result. 1. Buyer used this as a low-value bargaining chip citing bad employee experience and resignation of several key members on key projects. 2. I got my dues in relieving letter, evidencing service, within 48 hours of shot 2. 3. Company got gossip for years on how the management was dumb enough to mess with a lawyer, including a sermon from owners on how to not peeve off employees when they're trying to sell the company. 4. Senior guy 1 and 2 were left red-faced but survived because of old ties. However, their contracts were not renewed. 5. Senior guy 3 who threatened me became a consultant after the company was sold. The third story is... No tips, no problem. This was over 20 years ago, when it comes to mind, it still makes me smile. I was 20 and working for one of the largest event staffing agencies in Chicago. They're gone now, but they were number one at the time, and we were contracted to work the opening of the new Nordstrom's on Grand Avenue. This was a very big deal. They needed so many bodies, they also hired several of our friendly competitors to cover all the bases. I was very interested in becoming a bartender, but it was still a few months before I'd be turning 21. The bosses knew this, but were so hard up to meet their obligations they didn't care, and I ended up getting what can aptly be described as a crash course. My training for a position of extraordinary craft, nuance, knowledge, and precision was about 45 minutes long, and suddenly I was the only underage professional bartender in the city. I was stationed at a specialty satellite bar, which is to say me and one other guy, I think his name was Daniel, had a small bar tucked away on one of the upper floors of a huge multi-story shopping complex in women's wear, with only a few ingredients in huge quantities, and responsible for making only two cocktails, the Harvey Wallbanger and the Madras. This was a star-studded event for the creme de la creme of the city, and with the huge volume, speed would be essential. So we pumped out as many drinks as we could for a few hours. Now, no one is required to tip, especially in an event where everything's already paid for, but it's a nice thing that encourages prompt and professional service, even favoritism in some cases. And if you were in attendance at this particular event, you for sure weren't hurting for capital, but literally no one would give us a dollar. We were sweating, hauling, pumping, smiling all the while, and people weren't even being polite about it, let alone tossing us a quarter for what I could describe as a Herculean effort. It was frustrating. Inevitably, someone who just wanted a drink with no baggage came up and asked for just a vodka on ice, and it was top shelf product, Grey Goose if I recall. So Daniel poured them a pretty heroic amount. They walked away without a word, not even a thank you for bending the rules at our own peril. I watched Daniel do this and saw the look on his face, and we caught each other's gaze and had one of those moments where we communicated without a word. We nodded at each other and began our petty vengeance. The vodka, as I said, was all paid for, and we had a lot of it on hand with reserves off the floor. So we started pouring doubles, even triples, pretty much exclusively. All bets were off. Want a screwdriver instead? Have a double. Would the lady prefer a simple Cape Cod? Better make it a triple. It's already bought, so who cares? Just want vodka on ice? Have an entire glass, we're here to serve. No one in charge cared if we strayed from the recipe book, but eventually an event captain did approach us to let us know that someone mentioned we were pouring a little heavy, so maybe pull back a bit. We both said, sure thing, boss, and went right on getting people completely shammered. All sense of decorum and gentility evaporated around our bar, and after an hour we had people dancing in clothes they didn't pay for, making out with mannequins just the works. We still weren't making any tips, but it finally felt worth the effort. At the end of the event when we were breaking down our bar, a younger guy we hadn't served, we could tell because he wasn't SH-faced, came up to our bar and said, I used to do events and it's not easy. I could tell you guys were really working hard and you deserve this and tipped us each a $10 bill. He was the greatest capper to a banner evening and I salute him. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.